Okay, so uh, the next hour is going to be uh, an introduction to Good Radio. We actually have a good number of folks this year who are registered for just today, uh, which indicates to me that we might have a good number of folks who are genuinely new to all of this. Uh, so as a quick survey, can I get a show of hands for anyone uh, who has never used GNU Radio before? All right, we actually have a pretty good, pretty good set. How about a show of hands for anyone who's never used software-defined radio before? Still a few. Okay, so this is good. Uh, my, my material should be good. And um, for everyone else, I, I hope there's enough content in here that, that you learn something new and it's interesting. Um, I'm going to switch off to the lavalier. Is that okay? Great. Hello? All right, awesome. Okay, so what is software-defined radio? This is the official definition from our standards bodies, the IEEE and the Wireless Innovation Forum, previously known as the SDR Forum. By the way, I'm going to be moving very quickly. I have a lot of slides, so this is going to be like a fire hose. Um, so according to the IEEE, P1900.1 Working Group, and the Wireless Innovation Forum, the official definition accepted by industry is a radio in which some or all of the physical layer functions are software-defined. That's great. What does that mean? It means that processing is defined by programmed algorithms, not hardware. So instead of creating a circuit that does some math, you write some software that does some math. So uh, just as a quick note, software radio, software defined radio, I've never heard a distinction that made sense to me. I think they're the same. OK, so why is it awesome? Hardware is hard. Uh, and by that, I mean gen just generally, there are less people who do hardware than do software. Beyond that, hardware is much more expensive. Anyone with their PC can put together JavaScript or C++ or Python or whatever you want to do. Uh, if you don't have money to fabricate PCBs, have pick and place machines go over them, or do the solder yourself, it's much, much more expensive to get into hardware. Um, so software is a great solution to that problem. Uh, it's great for experimentation and prototyping. Uh, you're, you can change the functionality of your radio as quickly as you can write new code, which makes it very, very easy to just try out new things without the risk of spending $10,000 on a new hardware board that's not going to work. Future proofing. So Moore's Law is fun for everyone. Uh, it's a huge bummer when you design hardware and then two years later it's obsolete. Cool thing about software-defined radio is that if you do your abstractions properly, uh, when the latest and greatest hardware comes out, you can just migrate your software radio application to the new hardware. Requirements change. Uh, if you take a system, you deploy it in the field, three years later you realize, hey, I have this new thing I need to do. You have a new requirement. It's much easier to change out the software than it is to get out there and change out the hardware. Obsoleted parts and systems can be painful. If you've actually designed a system before, ever, and you're building it and you're selling it and 10 years later some critical component of your hardware goes obsolete, that's a tremendous pain. Uh, and kind of the obvious one is you have one device that can do a lot, right? Um, you have reconfigurability of the system. In the Green Radio community we typically call these knobs, right? There's knobs and meters. Meters are kind of the outputs that you see from your radio application. Knobs are the things you can tweak. So what is GNU Radio? And I'm going to go through, we're going to go through each of these. Uh, but just real quickly, our description on the website, if you go and look at the front page, is Gun Radio is a free and open source toolkit for software radio. This is not like a made up phrase. Each of these words actually mean something. We picked them very carefully. Uh, the keywords here are free, open source, toolkit, and software radio. And the purpose of this presentation is to break down each of these. Uh, the short blurb, though, is Gun Radio is tools and IP for building software radios. So, a brief history. In 1991, Joe Matola coins the term software radio. Mid to late 90s, a program at MIT called Spectrumware creates P-Spectra. Uh, in 1998, there was a commercial spin-off using the P-Spectra code. In 2001, there was an open source spin-off using the P-Spectra code, which was called GNU Radio. Uh, since then, actually pretty early on, there was a complete rewrite which removed the P-Spectra code. But um, that, was, that was key. Uh, in 2003, Matt Edis began work on the USERP. I've highlighted this specifically because this was the first time hardware was actually designed specifically to be used with GNU Radio. The original US USRP PCB boards on them actually said GNU Radio. Um, in 2010, Tom Rondeau became the project lead. 2011 was our very first GRCon, which was held at um, the University of Pennsylvania. In 2012, we heard our, held our first Hackfest. 2012, we also started participating in the Google Summer of Code. Um, 2016. Tom Rondeau moved on to DARPA MTO and uh, 
uh, myself and Jonathan Corgan have taken over his role. We also incorporated a Gun Radio Foundation earlier this year. Uh, 2016 was the first year we participated in the European Space Agency's um, software coding program. We'll go into that briefly. And this is also the first year that we have technical proceedings of this conference. Uh, so we'll be sending out information regarding that. And our uh, actual our, our technical proceedings chair is Tim O'Shea, who's on the organizer list. So we have a leadership organization. Uh, the way this is split out, uh, I am the project lead, and Jonathan is the chief architect. Over here with community manager Martin Braun. These three are officers of the GNU Radio Foundation. Uh, we have a system of tech leads that drives the development and technical direction of the project. We also have key packagers, so if you want to go to Ubuntu and apt get installed GNU Radio, or do it on Fedora, or do it on whatever system you want, including OSX, those are done by packaging developers. Uh, so Philip Ballister, if anyone is trying to deploy GNU Radio to embedded systems like ARMS, he maintains that. Maitland Bottoms, who is also here, does the Debian side. Michael Dickens, who's also one of the Gun Radio organizers, or sorry, GRCon organizers, is here. Um, and anybody who's watched the mailing list and seen Gun Radio release announcements, that is Nathan West, who's also the tech lead for Volk. So, our community. We have a mailing list. This is the preferred mode for discussion. It's called Discuss GNU Radio. Uh, and pretty much everything happens on the mailing list, from release announcements, uh, announcements about GRCon, uh, general technical support questions. We've recently started actually paying attention to Stack Overflow. People have been asking questions on Stack Overflow for years. We finally decided we should help them. Um, so if you search for the Gun Radio tag on Stack Overflow, uh, you will see a number of questions. There's usually a couple of day. Stack Overflow is really great for sort of one-off questions that don't require a long discussion. So if you have something that you think, I know there's a hard, discrete, factual answer to this, Stack Overflow is great. If you have something that's more of like a design question or you're, trying to have trouble, you're having trouble understanding something, the mailing list is the way to go. We use IRC and Slack very heavily. So IRC is the primary mode of communication. Uh, what we have found is that IRC can be difficult for many people who are unfamiliar with IRC to actually get in and start using it. So Slack is very familiar to a lot of people, and I'm sure many of you are actually using that at your day jobs. Uh, so if you're a Slack user, you can join our IRC chat rooms through your Slack account. We have instructions on how to do that on our website. Finally, we have lots of community events. We have meetups throughout the year, Hackfest, developer calls once a month, and conferences. Not just this one, but other conferences that we have a presence in and participate at. Software coding programs. So Google Summer of the Code is the one we've been doing the longest. Uh, for anybody who's unfamiliar, every summer, uh, Various open source projects apply to Google to be part of GSOC. Uh, so we apply every year. Google decides, yes, we will give you funding for students. And after we are accepted into Google's program, we put out a call for students. And if students would like to participate and be funded for the summer to work on something regarding GNU Radio, they can apply. And every year we have done this. So this year, we had two GSOC students. And they have posters over in the poster session if you'd like to go check them out. And this year was the first year we participated in the Summer of Code in Space which is run by the European Space Agency. It's very similar to GSOC, but funded by the EU. All right, so let's start diving into what this means. Let's talk about free. What is free? Uh, to understand this, you need to understand the term GNU Radio. Uh, so GNU Radio is part of the GNU project. As a quick show of hands, who knows what the GNU project is? All right, so about half the room. Uh, the purpose of the GNU project, this is a GNU if you're curious, uh, the purpose of the GNU project is to create a completely free operating system. It is run by the Free Software Foundation. The purpose of the Free Software Foundation is to support the free software movement. The purpose of the GNU project is to create a free software operating system. I went through that. So um, the GNU project is not just GNU Radio. There's many, many programs that are part of the GNU project, the effort to create this operating system. Uh, GNU Radio is just one of them. Uh, there's lots of others that you're probably familiar with, including GCC, right? Anybody who's compiled something on Linux more, more than likely is using GCC. Um, it's about this point that I realized the GNU project logos, with the exception of the GNU radios, which is fantastic, obviously. Um, they're not really big into logos, so I started using O'Reilly books. They also have GNU Make, GNU Emacs, dozens of others. The key point here is that GNU is not the same as GNU Radio. So what's free software? This thing I keep mentioning. 
uh, the free, so free Software Foundation prefers we call this Libre Software, but it's, the key here is that it's free as in freedom, not as in beer. Uh, the requirement is not that you do not have to pay money for free software. The requirement is that once you have the free software, you have total freedom to do whatever you want with it. Uh, this means basically use it for anything, good or evil. Um, as a side note, there's a number of uh, licenses where people will put cute phrases in there, like this software may not be used for evil. Believe it or not, that makes it incompatible with free software software because by the free software freedom zero, you should be able to use it for anything, including evil. Um, and the rest of these are you can change it, do whatever you want with it. You have the freedom to distribute the original. You have the freedom to distribute the modified copy. Uh, these are the four essential freedoms as the Free Software Foundation calls them. So uh, this is enforced through the, the general public license version three, which is what the GNU radio, which is what the GNU radio software distribution is licensed under. Uh, generally, there's a lot of FUD and misinformation about the GPL. Um, you hear a lot of people that are scared about the GPL infecting your stuff. Uh, that's a common word. Uh, if you ever have any questions about how that works, please just ask us. Uh, there are things you need to be aware of if, you're, if you intend to sell a product with GPL software in it, as an example, but that is regularly done. So if you have any questions, please just ask. Uh, but the, GNU, the primary set portion of the GNU Radio software distribution is copyright of the Free Software Foundation for this purpose. And this is why you see this blurb at the top of all the GNU Radio source files. It says, obviously it doesn't say FUBAR, but it says it's free software and then you get the, GNU, the GPL version 3 header. All right, let's talk about open source. So these first three are generally the same, free and open source software free libre open source software, free slash libre open source software, and finally, open source software. These first three are all the same. Free and libre are, are exactly the same thing. Free Software Foundation prefers the use of libre because the term free is overloaded because it gets confusing. Is it, am I paying for something or is it free and freedom? They think libre is more clear, but the key is that uh, all free software is open source, but not all open source is free software. At this point, most people use the term open source just to refer to a development methodology. Uh, is open source important? Well, I think the answer is yes. So this is Microsoft open sourcing one of their key technologies, .NET. This is Apple open sourcing one of their key technologies, Swift. In fact, Apple went so far as, and this is how you can tell open source is a big deal, Apple declared that they were the first people to do it. Um, you could argue, now that took real courage. Uh, this is obviously complete garbage. But in all seriousness, open source is a huge deal. This is a 2009 memo from the United States Department of Defense Chief Information Officer telling DOD agencies and contractors why you should use open source software and when it is appropriate to use. Not more than a month and a half ago from the Office of the President, United States Chief Information Officer created a basically did the exact same thing, but for all federal agencies, not just defense, and established a pilot program wherein 20% of all taxpayer-funded soft software must be released as open source code. So if you're not on the open source bandwagon yet, you need to get there. All right, Green Radio is a free and open source toolkit. What does toolkit mean? It's kind of like an overlaid term, what is a framework, right? But um, to understand this, you need to understand some key terms and what the tools actually are within the project. So, good radio applications are generally called flow graphs. This is an example of a flow graph. A flow graph is a, if you want to get technical about it, is a directed acyclic graph of streaming data that moves through processing blocks. So here you can see a unidirectional path of data. So this is a data stream moving through processing blocks. So Jonathan Corgan has a lot of technical details in his presentation about how this works. I'm not going to dive into them. The key thing to understand is that when you write a GNU Radio application, what you're creating is this flow graph, and that's the language that we use. Uh, in order cre to create flow graphs, we have something called the GNU Radio Companion. This is probably the tool most commonly used by any GNU Radio developer. Uh, you drag and drop blocks, you connect them, put together your flow graph, click run, and everything goes. Um, but your, the GRC is effectively a code generation tool. It's helping you it generates code that connects all the graphs together for you. You don't have to do this, you could write the code yourself. Other tools that we have, Volk, 
This is the vector optimized library of kernels. Uh, so this is a library of math routines that's optimized with SIMD. So as an example, if you're using one of your um, you know, an Intel or AMD processor, there's probably, uh, you almost certainly have an ISA, instruction set architecture, that supports SIMD operations. Uh, so when you're running your flow graph, if you have, or doing things in there like a dot multiply, for example, which is something that can be vectorized, uh, and Volk is installed with your Gunner Radio installation, it'll check and see, hey, can I do this with vector operations on your machine? This happens for you if Volk is installed and you've configured it. Now, the cool thing about this is that we've actually split Volk out, and you can use Volk outside of GNU Radio. Uh, and there's several instances of software out in the world, including an LTE stack uh, from the SRS guys. I think Paul might be here. Is Paul here? No? Paul's registered. Um, so there's an SRS LTE stack that actually uses Volk in their LTE base station outside of GNU Radio. Processing blocks. Um, I'm not going to dive too heavily into this, but we have a lot of processing blocks that are really awesome. Uh, they go from the extremely simple things, like add blocks, um, to rational resamplers, to PSK modulation and demodulation, and we get into OFDM, polyphase channelizers. Uh, there's just a huge amount of stuff that's included in the Gun Radio core distribution. Um, and you can do anything from low level you know, some ads and Boolean at math to, oh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create an OFDM system. I'm just gonna drop an OFDM modulator. Uh, so this all operates on the concept of data sources and sinks. So sources are where data starts in your flow graph. So this is, going back to the same flow graph I looked at earlier, this is the start of a flow graph, this is the end. So this block here is sourcing data through the flow graph. Sinks are where it ends. So sources can be anything. They can be digital sources, like a sine wave generator that's entirely in software. It can be a piece of hardware. You can see here this is an RTL SDR connected to my laptop. Uh, it can be file pipes, network ports. Uh, and it's the same way with sinks. And we have a lot of graphical sinks for you to use, including simple things like oscilloscopes and frequency analysis, constellation plots, Real-time spectrum analyzer called Phosphor, written by Sylvain, who is also here. This is really, really cool software, and if you go to the vendor area, you're almost certainly gonna see this in the numer numerous booths. Uh, and like any good um, toolkit, you can rearrange all these graphical syncs to create an application and kind of a front panel uh, that works best for what you're trying to do. We have lots of other nifty tools that are included, like a filter design tool, by the way, this was a GSOC project three years ago, Boston, three years ago was presented. Yep. Uh, performance instru instrumentation, which we call performance counters. If you're trying to, if you've created your flow graph, you're confident that it works, and now you want to put it on a little embedded system and go stick it up on a telephone pole, and you want to figure out how to optimize this because I have much lower um, computational resources, you can use this. Remote flow graph monitoring and debug, and RF knock which allows you to accelerate your flow graphs with FPGAs. So here, you notice this flow graph looks exactly the same as all the others, except these colors are different. And what's happening is I'm starting on my host computer, sending data, I'm offloading processing into an FPGA and bringing it back. And this all happens seamlessly. Uh, so there's a number of presentations this week about RF knock. If you're curious, you can check that out. And so the major item here is what we provide is a unified workflow that you can take from, from your design to deployment. So when you create your flow graph, you can start purely by simulating. You can have digital sources and digital sinks. Uh, then you can connect hardware, maybe replace your source with a piece of hardware so you're receiving and then doing processing. And eventually you can deploy it. And you can do all of this through a single workflow with the tools that are provided. So as an example of this, you see here um, a flow graph where this is a random, this is a random source. It's really, this chunk of the flow graph here is generating random data and modulating it. So the data is not useful at all. But what you see over here is we can pipe it into either a GUI sync or a piece of hardware. And there's no difference in connecting these blocks. You drop the blocks down and connect, connect them to each. And that's the difference between simulating a communication system and actually transmitting. So community development. Uh, I went through a lot of blocks that we have in our primary distribution. Chances are, if we don't have a block that you need, 
Somebody else has also wanted that block. So uh, we call these out of tree modules, and they are created by the community, and they do awesome things. So uh, these are all hosted on a website called CGRAN, which stands for the Comprehensive Green Radio Archive Network, uh, which is kind of a play on CPAN and a dozen other open source archive network projects. Uh, so if you head to cgran.org, this is what you'll see. And you get a list of all the out of tree projects, uh, what they're tagged with, their description, links to the source code repository. And there's a lot of really cool ones, like GR Theano, written by Tim O'Shea for doing GPU processing. GNSS, IEEE 802.15.4, which is Zigbee. DVB-S2 uh, transmitter. GR Air Modes, which is for, well, tracking plans. Um, and if you don't want to manage all of this installation and source code yourself, we have something called PyBombs. I'm not going to dive into this, because if you look at your schedule, Martin Braun, who is the author of PyBombs, will be giving an intro to that, uh, I believe, right after lunch. But it allows you to manage your Green Radio installations and all of, out of your tree module, and all of your out-of-tree modules pretty easily without having to do it yourself. Lastly, software radio. OK, so we've gone through what free means, what open source means, and all the cool stuff in a toolkit. So what can you actually do with software radio? Here I just have a few examples of awesome stuff that has happened to run through. Uh, a really recent one is the sounding rocket uh, that Virginia Tech launched, where Gunner Radio was not only running in the sounding rocket, but was running in the ground station. So there's a pretty sizable crew from Virginia Tech here, and they have a poster on this over there. If you're interested in this, I recommend you talk to them. Uh, the ISEE 3 reboot. Uh, and Balant Sieber, who I saw earlier, are you in the room? No? All right, he's probably next door. Uh, so he was the kind of the technical lead on this. So for I IC3 was a satellite that launched in the 80s. You can see it did a whole bunch of crazy stuff. Um, Dr. Scott Palo can probably understand this. It, I have no idea what's happening. But it did a whole bunch of loops and shot off into space. And then a couple of years ago, they realized, hey, this is going to come back and loop back around Earth. It would be really cool if we could turn it back on, change its trajectory, put it into an orbit, and actually make use of the scientific instrumentation. The problem was, this was launched in the 80s, right? So it was designed in the late 70s and early 80s. NASA no longer had the communications equipment to actually talk to this thing. Remember going back to my examples about why software radio is awesome. Hardware is hard. Obsoleted parts are hard. Reconfigurability is awesome. So. What Ballant did is he took a software-defined radio, USRP, connected it to the Arecibo dish, and ran GNU radio in the background, and actually turned the satellite back on. Uh, unfortunately, it ran out of some fuel, and so they couldn't change the trajectory. But they actually were able to get back in touch with it and reactivate the comm system and start doing readouts, uh, which is something that NASA could no longer do, simply with the use of a relatively cheap um, couple thousand dollar software-defined radio and GNU radio. Another example, an ATSC receiver. I, I kind of Googled the web. I, this is an unfortunate picture. Um, but <laughs> so uh, even things like receiving digital TV over the air in real time is relatively simple. And we have, again, blocks that can do these decodings for you. Right? This is an ATSC receive pipeline. Uh, so this is an example of the ADSB bit that I mentioned before uh, from the GR air modes out of tree project. Uh, which listens to um, air traffic transponders. And this particular user has then piped that into Google Maps. And so he's plotting air traffic in real time. Uh, this one is also really recent. This was really cool. Uh, so this was a security, cybersecurity crew. What they developed was uh, malware that, once put on a laptop, uh, change the signaling frequency of how your computer talks to USB thumb drives in a way that's you know, it's emitting RF, right? And so using GNU Radio through walls, they can receive it. So they've effectively jumped the air gap on secure networks through this malware using GNU Radio. Uh, lastly, I want to mention this GNU Radio in education. So uh, Dr. Scott Palo mentioned this just before. Uh, this is a really, really big deal for us. Uh, not only at um, the graduate level, but really at all levels. So um, graduate students, obviously, uh, there's a lot of grad students here, the huge users of it. Uh, but so Dr. Peter Mathis, who will be talking later about uh, using it for undergraduate curriculum, um, 
we have uh, just recently actually Dr. Uh, Richard, Tom, what's Richard's last name? Prestige. Prestige. Yeah, so Richard Prestige, uh, working with Martin, we're able to secure NSF funding, not only to train students, but to train instructors and professors on how to use Gunner Radio in curriculum. Uh, so if you're interested in getting involved with this, uh, Martin Braun, again, who is an officer of the Gunner Radio Foundation and the community manager, uh, is leading this. So he's right here. I see, I see him trying to, yeah, that's Martin. If you're interested, go talk to Martin. All right, so how do you become involved? First of all, join the discussion list. Even if you have absolutely no intent of ever sending a message, it is awesome just to read, see what's going on, keep up with the community. Uh, check out the website. We have blogs and we have news releases. We're, all, we're on social media like everybody else. Um, we try to do fun things on our Twitter account. There's really cool YouTube videos. So we have our own Gunner Radio YouTube account, which is where we post recordings of all our dev calls, for example. But if you just search Gunner Radio, there's all kinds of awesome videos of people doing crazy things. Um, we have a LinkedIn group, and we're also on GitHub. How do you, so this is awesome. You love Gunner Radio, you want to get involved. How do you contribute? Step one, become a user. If you're not sure how to be a user, we have guided tutorials that you can find on the website. There's a link here, and there's a link on the website. Um, this is a great way just to get going, just to get things installed and figure out what you're doing. Uh, just being a user of the project is really a great way to, uh, is, as, you, as you're using the project, you can provide us feedback. Um, hopefully, you'll start taking part in discussions. It's the best way of getting involved. Um, once you've done that, you can do things like file bugs. If you want, you can write documentation or articles or blog posts. Submit patches. This is kind of the next step, right? You're becoming an advanced user. You want to start writing patches and fix things. You can submit, the easiest way to do that is through GitHub pull requests. And lastly, spreading the word. So things like YouTube videos, academic papers, blog posts, uh, these are all really, really good for the community. And that's the end of my presentation, and we almost managed to get back on time. Uh, so while we're doing a quick switch off, and come on up and I'll um, get switch off, does anybody have questions for me? What's up, Martin? Even without Ben's presentation, I was already approached about the education thing. There's a lot of interest, and there'll be a birds of feather to chat about education. I don't know exactly when or where. Um, I'll just post it on the Kinder Radio mailing list and on the educators mailing list. So keep your eyes open for that if you're interested in, in education. And just know how much note taking I should be taking. Is, are these slides access accessible anywhere for us? Check, check. Yes, so a actually, as each presenter is coming up to present, uh, Michael, are we still doing that in live? We're going to be doing that. We're not quite there yet because I've been too busy. Not a problem. After day one mayhem is over, we will be posting the presentations as soon as each speaker starts speaking. Uh, so yes, these will be live on the website very soon. There's 109 of them, by the way. I don't trust animations, so I make one slide per bullet. But don't, yeah, so don't, don't freak out when you see the slide count. 